Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invite to come to your uh, seminar today. Uh, my presentation is a collaborative approach to the protection of heritage buildings. The uh, Fire and Rescue Service in the UK are um, at the centre of the community and um, while we respond to emergencies, a lot of the work we do now is actually preventing and protecting, enforcing on legislation. Um, and my task to protect heritage buildings was to achieve this without any financial, physical um, or human resources. So it was quite a challenge. Representing the Chief Fire Officers Association today, um, as you can see, the, uh, the professional advice to inform government, and within that there's a separate section that actually uh, proposes um, to protect heritage buildings throughout the UK. And over here is a map of the UK, and the way the organisation is split is split into countries, Scotland and Wales, and the UK and England is split into regions and that will become relevant later on in the presentation. So if I take you through some of our uh, disasters, and the, that's perhaps why I'm here today, um, on the top left here is Windsor Castle from the 1992 fire. And the middle picture you can see on the top, this one here is the aftermath of the St. George's Hall. While it was rebuilt on the right-hand side, you can see that and recognize the fact that all the history from a thousand years has now gone and it's been lost. And nearer to where I live, this Jacobean Hall from the 16th century again caught fire and was rebuilt in the 18th, uh, 1830s, as you can see there. Uh, the architect uh, was a chap called E.M. Barry, and um, I'll come on to him a bit later on. But during the last few centuries in the UK, being an architect is quite good business because of the number of fires we had. They were always having to redesign and rebuild our, our buildings. Uh, the top left-hand side there was our Houses of Parliament, the timber frame building, and that's perhaps the one you recognise now. The, the architect, the, the, the father of the architect I just mentioned was the architect for the Houses of Parliament. Um, again, nearly all of these buildings get rebuilt due to the fact that they've been burnt down in the first place. And the bottom one was a lightning bolt at York Minster, and you can see the damage that that was caused. So in the UK, and particularly England, we grade buildings and then we try and protect them. And as you can see there now, there's 376,000 buildings in England alone that are actually listed. Grade one, two star, and grade two. Those buildings, all buildings from 1700, before, before 1700 are, are already protected. Most of them between 1700 and 1840. And then based on merit afterwards. And a listed building may not be da demolished, extended, altered without permission from the government. But listed buildings in the UK are not all just grand houses and uh, beautiful ornate properties. This one on the top right here, it, it's a listed building because it had, at the time, the largest concrete roof span in, in Europe in 1950. This one here, these canopies are listed and can't be touched. They were from the 1960s and are one of the few uh, left in, in Europe. Perhaps you'd expect the bottom left to be listed. That's Anne Hathaway's cottage, who you might uh, be aware, she married William Shakespeare. And so that, that's a listed building. But this block of flats is a listed building and is protected. It was by the uh, architect um, Erno Goldfinger. And um, he was a brutalist architect. Uh, I think he was a Hungarian. And I think people either love his architecture or, or not. And you might, you might recognize the villain in, the, in there. Um, Ian Fleming hated the work of uh, the architect so much, he just changed Erno to Auric, and Auric Goldfinger uh, became the villain in his 1959 uh, uh, book, Goldfinger. That's the kind of passion in, sometimes in the UK that it, it generates. 
The reasons people come to the UK, studies have shown it's heritage, history, pageantry and culture. That's the reasons why people come. And, the reason, and the, when people come to the UK, it's rec recognised that the gross domestic product is over £26 billion a year. So it's a huge investment and a huge reason why we should try and protect the heritage in our country. I'm sure you'll agree it supports the local, regional and national economy. Um, it employs three quarters of a million people in the UK directly. Uh, and it en enriches the quality of our life. This is an example of what can happen to a small community. This is Dartmouth in, in the south of England. They have a fire which probably all of you in the room would think it's not a great big fire. Um, but look what's happened. The, the hoardings have been put up, the streets are closed, there's no one getting to work, there's nobody shopping. And the company that's been brought in is a demolition company, which is the usual thing to do. And demolition companies are very good at knocking buildings down. But what you'll see here are some what we call acro props, steel props, which are holding up this Elizabethan 15th uh, century um, facade. So they're actually the company is there to try and keep the building up, not knock it down. But that's not the message being sent out to the public. And from the street below, this is cordoned off here. It's like that for the next 18 months. Some businesses not only didn't, uh, were closed, they never reopened and those people lost their livelihoods. And if we have a look at the impact of social media, if you were thinking of going to Dartmouth, comments like uh, buildings being blazes sweeping through and uh, the town like a war zone, that's now on Twitter and Facebook across the world and has a huge impact on the economy of the, of the local uh, area. While well, we mentioned 18 months and they were closed, this is um, a, an area of Edinburgh called Cowgate. They had a fire in 2002. And there's an assumption that economic generation would just come back. That's a picture taken 10 years later. It's not always a guarantee that economic generation will, will regrow within a town or a city. So if I go on to the risks to firefighters, I'm sure you'll appreciate there are huge risks in old buildings in terms of common uh, voids and passages for air, undetected fire, and it's, it's recognised in the UK that they pose significant risks to, to the lives of firefighters. Um, these firefighters on the bottom left here can be seen on YouTube going in and out of this building, trying to, to attack and put the fire out. You can see from the top right they can't actually see the damage that's already taken place and the fire's gone through the roof. So you can see there that such as the, the risk in this small fire that we consider in the UK uh, that um, heritage buildings need a special uh, assessment when we're doing our operational risk visits to make sure that we understand how the fire would develop. As you can see here now at the top there, there's, there's a number of guidance you can access electronically about protecting heritage properties that, across Europe. The first one was Cost Action 17. There's another one here on European Guides. But I'll draw your attention to this manual. There's a fairly recent one with a number of cities from around Europe that have produced this online uh, material that you can access, which looks at the whole, the prevention, the protection, uh, the emergency arrangements, salvage, the whole package was in, is within that document and you can access that online. And in the UK, again, these documents are online. Uh, our governments have given us guidance of what every fire and rescue service should actually do to protect heritage buildings. They haven't given us any money or resources, but they have given us some guidance. Uh, Scotland have produced guidance. Again, this is available online and the Fire Protection Association. So if people are wanting to start and look at how to go about protecting heritage buildings in their community, simply go online, use Google, and you will find a wealth of information. In the UK as well, we've been encouraging fire and rescue services to put information on their websites. My own service is up here, Hampshire and London Fire Service. There's three examples of where uh, anyone who wants to deal with heritage buildings can access information. 
we go back to the buildings, um, you can see here we've got Brighton Pier, Cumin Museum in uh, London, Hampton Court, another pier on, at Eastbourne. And just to remind us all that it's, we still haven't solved the problem, those fires have taken place over the last 20 years. But this one here was last summer. It's called Clandon Park House. The National Trust have estimated the loss to be in, in excess of 65 million uh, pounds. So I think that's approximately 70,000 euros. So what I was asked to do was to set up a group, again, no additional resources, just passionate people who really want to make a difference. And in the northwest region, we set a partnership between uh, fire and rescue services and all of the people involved with heritage. So we've got building control, uh, people who uh, control the uh, building and the alterations of, of uh, buildings, planning officers, municipal uh, officers. And we all get together, usually about every three months, and we visit a site where we give advice, but at the same time we meet to create a network so that we can actually uh, make a difference across the UK. This is St George's Hall in Liverpool. That's where Liverpool normally stand on the top with their trophies, but I'm led to believe they haven't been up there for a few years. Um, and down below is there is a concert hall, a theatre, uh, and a, and a uh, crown court. So you can go for a dance and be sentenced to death all in the same court when it was open. That's the, out, that's the outside of the building. It's a neoclassical uh, building. And it has, like with lots of heritage buildings, will be the same in Portugal, there are lots of firsts. This is the first air-conditioned building uh, in the world. Dr. Boswell Reed designed the air conditioned in here. Coke ovens heating uh, water pipes, which heated the air. And lots of people then going around vertical and horizontal shafts, and they were either drawing or uh, pushing the air through, depending on the time of year. It was so successful that, the, that our new parliament also had that, that system put in place. So what did we achieve by this group? Well, we communications network. That was the key, number one thing. Everyone knew each other so that when any problems arose with any of the agencies across the UK, people could make, make contact and get specialist advice. Um, we share knowledge. We develop guidance, particularly for churches or uh, thatched cottages, whatever type of listed building, we provide a, uh, separate guidance. Exercise, operational exercises. This is where we train on uh, heritage buildings on how to protect them and also how to recover all the artifacts. Uh, my task was then to take this around the UK um, and also uh, our mobilising system. If you can be told on the way to a building that it's a heritage building and it's listed, that gives the incident commander or the officer in charge additional information that he or she can use to try and protect the building. And again, talking of the first, this building here, which you can see is be, being renovated, it's the first, um, it's the grandfather of skyscrapers. It's the first iron-clad, five-storey building, um, cast iron columns, cast iron beams in 1797. So again, another first that we'd like to protect. On the top left there, you can see what we're doing there is we, we run courses with the Fire and Rescue Service and all of the conservators and people who would actually um, be involved um, in uh, a heritage fire. So people from the site, people from the government, from the municipal areas, they would all come along and learn how to work with an incident commander at a fire. And they're using simple techniques. Just If you put books on inside a table with some plastic sheets and put a fan on the other side, it's one of the best recognized ways of naturally drying out books that have become wet. So they're just practicing and learning how to do these techniques. And, and unfortunately, uh, as, as I mentioned in Clandon Park last year, this is examples of exactly what's going on there. Firefighters and staff and conservators are all working together to try and bring out the artifacts, secure them because some of them are extremely valuable, first aid decontamination, and then starting to log them and protect them for more complex uh, cleaning. 
I, have, I don't have the time today to talk you through the whole of the, the way we would work with our uh, damage limitation and our salvage plans. But what you'll see here is a couple of examples. These are laminate sheets that are kept on site and the top, usually the top 10 items from a place that need recovering. So you can see there, there is a plan of the floor for the firefighters. When the, they can see then when the door to enter and where the object is, whether to recover it. And on this side, You've got a picture so they can recognize it, the dimensions, the number of people it will take to lift, what they need to be wearing, and then down below here is where we start to record all the information once it's been brought out and how it's been protected. If you need any more information on that, I can, I can supply you with that. So that was a quick whistle-stop tour on what we were doing uh, across the country with our network teams. This is a, a particular place now, it's the city of Chester. It's an old Roman AD 79 um, city. It has the oldest race course in the UK. Um, for some reason they race anti-clockwise, which I believe is the, not the norm. Um, on the top here you will see these, this is how it looks today. And from a firefighting point of view, you can see on the bottom pictures, particularly with a whole city full of these uh, different roof levels and skylights and no rear access, it's really difficult to get, to get in there. And what the concern of the council was is if we lose this city in that particular region, the economic um, difficulty we put in, into the whole region for, the, for commerce and for tourism, this city is absolutely massive. Um, international tourism, Every hotel is full throughout the year. The last thing we need is, like you saw in Dartmouth, is for the message to get out that a fire has devastated Chester. The pictures on the top there are also something unique. They're the, called the Chester Rows, and these are walkways at first floor level, which we believe are unique across the world. And they, that's how they look today. So they're quite similar. And again, most of the city is actually listed. Every building within the city is listed. But unfortunately, we did have a fire, and the council, as you can imagine, were extremely concerned. The firefighters were exceptionally professional, but also very lucky that there was an alleyway down the back here, and they could actually stop the fire from spreading through the city. So what did we do in response? Well, we set this group up. Again, no additional resources. These are people who have already got full-time jobs, just with the passion to make a difference. So you've got myself in the corner there, you've got an administration. But what I'll draw your attention to is the key people are politicians. Local politicians really make things happen and really open doors. And I would encourage anyone that's setting up any kind of group to have politicians involved. They have helped us so much make things happen. So this, this group now works within the city. And what we first of all did was we took the city and we put it into zones. Then we separated the zones and you can see here sub subdivided the zones. And that gives us what we have on this side on the bottom left. The UK legislation on fire safety in commercial buildings is enforced uh, by the fire service. So my team were able to establish non-invasive inspections and say that that line there and this line here, everything within it is a building one building. So all of those occupiers must talk to each other, share their risk assessments, and make sure everybody can get out in the event of a fire. So that's the commercial element. The second element are, you can see some flats. We would go and fit smoke detectors in all of the flats, give advice on how to prevent and how to reduce the, the chance of a fire starting. Um, and then thirdly, operational firefighters would go out and do their operational plans so that in the event of everything failing, and they have to respond, then they can actually uh, deal with the incident. This is the initial catalyst of those inspections. It's a report jointly done by uh, a building officer and a firefighter, and they go out and they assess the building non-invasively. We appreciate we can't rip wooden panels off, off walls, etc. cetera. Um, it's a professional best guess at where we could make a fire stop within that building and then how to apply the legislation. 
And that's the catalyst then for the operational crews, for the fire protection crews and the, and the domestic prevention crews. And this is one example of what we've done, again, at no cost. What you'll see here is the politicians being involved. This is what we call an impact day. All the agencies get together and we go to the business to give advice on prevention, protection, gathering intelligence. Um, this chap here, he's actually enforcing waste management so that everyone in the city has their waste removed so that it reduces the chance of arson. But it also has spin-offs as it Im improves the image of the city for all of the tourists. We're split up into teams and on that one day we did 530 businesses within the city just in one day. And the total, the total cost was just a couple of sandwiches for each person at lunchtime. We just make these things happen. So, operational plans and tactics are produced. These, I don't know what you have in, in, uh, in Portugal, these are our mobile data terminals. Every fire engine in the UK has one. And they can access all the operational information, plans, photographs, etc., as they're being mobilized to the incident so they know what to expect when they get there. Um, the prevention, so the information from building occupiers and other enforcing agencies, that's all been achieved. Um, political engagement, which I've mentioned, that's absolutely key. Our corporate social responsibility. The UK Fire and Rescue Service is being uh, directed by government to be at the fore of, um, while we're facing austerity measures, be to be at the fore of the recovery from the recession and support businesses. It recognises we support businesses and they're successful, they don't have a fire, then that, in, that encourages the economy. Um, partnership working, again, that's really improved the image uh, of the Fire and Rescue Service, of what we can actually contribute to the community. And the, the end spin-off for ourselves is then is the improved uh, profile, our branding, and our, st and our status in the community, which helps us then go back around the circle and uh, get more support for any other initiatives that we're trying to do. Um, this chap here is a politician on the bottom left. Um, he isn't short, by the way. Uh, this chap is two metres, three centimetres, six foot eight. So, uh, so everyone thinks the guy on the left is little, but he, but he isn't. He's the chief fire officer, and uh, the fire engine isn't one of our latest, it is, uh, it is a museum piece. Um, I've hopefully uh, brought, brought you a few extra minutes, uh, Nelson, by whizzing through. Um, so I'd like to thank you for your, uh, your time and the invitation today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark.